Hey beauties, good evening to you beautiful people. You know beautiful people, there's a topic that I want to discuss and we're going to bring our bright minds, our intellectual minds, our critical thinking skills, our emotional intelligence, our mental ability to this particular post, you know, if you feel to comment. And it's a whole thing about prosperity gospel and over the years I've often heard traditional church people hitting out against it, you know, and I couldn't understand why. I just hear them say it and I, in my mind, I didn't really, there was no brainstorming on it. You know, I said, okay, maybe it's heresy they're preaching. Perhaps it's something that is not of God, you know, but I said, I, I don't know. The word prosperity seemed to be a very positive word word even though it is used as it relates to the heathens to those who are rebellious against the cause of Christ you know when you look at Jeremiah 12 chapter 1 you know Jeremiah is basically belly aching he's saying God I don't understand the man out there is for example unaliving people he's robbing he's stealing and it is though his hands are like gold when you touch it I mean when he touches everything it becomes gold you know, and the one who is doing your work, it's like everything that his hand touches become garbage and trash. He's struggling, he or she's struggling, he or she's suffering. I don't understand. And David, his predecessor, said similar, said, God, David really complained. He said, God, I feel basically envious of the wicked. Not envy in a malicious or malignant way or jealous in a malicious, malicious or malignant way, but not really being happy for them because he says, God, imagine they're corrupt in all their ways, basically, and they are doing well. Anything that they put their hands to are doing well. And we know of that kind of a seeming prosperity, you know, um, which really doesn't necessarily come from God. He may allow something. He may just allow something to go through us. So seemingly sanction it. But it's not necessarily a part of his perfect will. Because we realize that prosperity itself. You know God in Psalm 75. It says about 6 and 7. For promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. But God is a judge. He, set, he putteth down one or set it up one put down another. You know. And we understand now that prosperity is a part of the mantra of God, but not just prosperity, but blessing, favor, you know. And I said to myself, but I don't understand. Why is it that they're hitting out, hitting out against and lambasting and creating a vitriol around, a rancor around this prosperity gospel? I said, Lord, you know, and then you will hear people talk about, oh, because they talk about name it and claim it. And I said, all right, let us dissect you know, using the laws of deduction when they say name it and claim it. Because sometimes we hear a terminology because we like catchphrases, you know, but it don't it doesn't necessarily mean that it is very on the it's on the periphery or it is very you baseless, useless, useless or weightless. You know, in Romans chapter four, verse seventeen or seventeen verse four. I think it's seventeen verse four. It says call things that are not as though they are or though they were so you use the past participle were and continues to be you know and I said that would almost sound like a sort of a name it and claim it Lord I'm not really understanding in the third book of John chapter 1 it talks about above all things I wish for you to prosper meaning I wish for you to financially do well to mentally do well to physically do well but I also want your soul to prosper so I want you to emotionally do well I want you to psychologically to do well I want you to socially do well so when we look at all the seven alleys physically emotionally spiritually financially I did mention sp sorry spiritually I'm now calling it f spiritually financially physically emotionally psychologically educationally and socially this is what the third book of John has actually promulgated so in all of that that speaks to not just prosperity it speaks to blessing and favor and when I thought about and start to really meditate on Paul's missions you know in his writings and in the in his charges to the different Christians and non-Christians he had to get help from a woman called Phoebe if you research who Phoebe is she's a wealthy woman 
and she has aided in the cause of Paul's missions. Paul was a tent maker, meaning the people who used to make that, what you say the Jews wear, the well, that expensive, uh, forgive me for saying Taliban clothes, I don't know how to describe it. That thing that they throw over them, like a sheeting thing. You know, it is quite expensive. And he made it, and that is why Paul was able to say, I know what it is to be almost like in riches, not necessarily in poverty, but to be content. I know what kind of struggling is like, you know, in a financial sense, you know, and that is why Philippians 4, you know, when it talks about, um, the scripture just eluded me, uh, you know, the riches in glory, it really was talking about finances. You know, I soon tell you the, the particular scripture. If I don't remember it for this video, I'll talk about it for in another video, you know? Um, so God, God grant all your needs according to his riches in the glory, in glory. It really was a financial one he was talking about. So when we look at that, it already tells a story that finances are important. You know, I was listening to the very gifted and esteemed Les Brown. And he said, boy, God, I just want enough to help people take care of my family, give back to charity, you know. And he said he realizes that to do all of that, it takes cash to do it. It takes wealth to do it. And I said to myself, the churches have remained poor, broke, pauperized, bitter, resentful, hateful, angry, and ineffective to the world because they lack the resources. They lack the funding to actually get out into mainstream media to promulgate the message of Jesus Christ. Remember, the message of D Jesus Christ is multidimensional. Yes, ultimately, it's spiritual. That is why he says, whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we lose on earth is loose in heaven. So it starts in the spiritual realm, you know. But for us to charter our courses here on earth, we have to follow the laws of the land as we follow the laws of Christ. And it requires cash to do all of this. It requires that, that popularity, that fame, that fortune to carry forth so how is it that we're against prosperity gospel when we think of people like abraham the bible says he was a great and a rich man some say a wealthy man some verse versions when we think of job in terms of what he owned he would make um what's the name of the man who owns x again looks like look almost seem ordinary in his wealth the level of wealth that Job have, had, sorry, yet he remained humble and submitted before God. The scripture said in Matthew, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed is the humble at heart. That is what he says. He didn't say blessed is the poor in pocket. I think we use the scripture when it said that rich man came to Jesus. What must I do to be saved? And he said, give away all you had to the poor. He just needed to see where his heart was. It probably would not have. It may have been a, almost a, a modern day replica of what happened with Abraham. When God said, give me your only son. You know, it was talking legitimate son as a sacrifice. He wasn't going to take the son, but he just needed to see where his heart was. Could be with the rich man, he would take his will, but he probably would have given him twice, three times the amount again. You know, because he realized he would give up everything for God. He would show that he loves the Lord, his, the Lord his God with all of his heart, with all of his mind, with all of his soul, with all of his strength. And loving his neighbor as he loves himself. So therefore, if we're hitting, up, hitting out against and creating a vitriol and a rancor around prosperity gospel, it means that we're welcoming a poverty gospel. Because if it's not wealth, it is poverty. If it is not wealth, it is poverty. So we are really lauding a poverty gospel because there are people who believe the poor you are, you are of God. If what I'm saying is wrong, why you don't find people going into the Norbrooks, the Beverly Hills and all these and the plantation heights to bring the message of Christ to those people? Aren't they humans? Weren't they made by God? We go only into the inner cities. Why not go to those places? Because we assume that the wealth is not of God, that they have been cast out and cast aside. But yet God used quite a number of the wealthy men and women of old, popular ones that we know, starting from Abraham, coming right down to, the, to Paul and John and all these wonderful um, apostles and ministers of the gospel who had wealth. It takes cash to care. So if it is not a prosperity gospel, it has to be a poverty gospel. And Jesus became poor so that we become rich. Poverty is not of God. Poverty is not of God. I can understand if you feel people are putting it above the cause of Christ. Anything that you put as idols, it's well, that is a it stirs away from the kingdom of God and the cause of Christ. But prosperity gospel is needed. 
if you listen to what I said carefully. It's not poverty gospel. All right, guys, you know what to do, read TikTok and YouTube. Have a good one.